What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Outlier Podcast. I got Tom Sosnoff on one more time. It's been about a quarter since we spoke last. Welcome back. Great to have you. Awesome. Awesome. So NVIDIA is now up to 720. Today is the 21st of February. Anybody wondering? What do you think about that? I was hoping for a down 100. So um, up, up, what is it? Up, where is it right now? I'm looking at my, it's up on to my 720. iPhone. Yeah, 718, 717. Yeah. So um uh well, you know, it's it's had a last couple of days it's gone from about 745 down to 770, let's say. I'm down to 670, back to 720. Um I don't know. I don't think it's gonna hold this rally. I think it's I think it's grossly overvalued here, but let's see. We'll see. Isn't that like the struggle of a just permanent contrarian in that sense? Because you see things yeah. that start showing strength like this and who knows, right? Like, what did you think of it out of curiosity when it was trading in like the high fives? Was that still like overvalued for your perception oh, yeah. of it? Yeah, 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 yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as a, as kind of a, you know, a raw contrarian, we, we don't, there's, there's almost, like it's impossible. You're never going to know where the top is, especially on a run, runaway train or anything like that. So you're going to pick a spot. And at that spot, you're going to convince yourself that that is the spot. The only thing you're going to do though, to protect yourself is you're going to try to keep your size in check and you're not going to add to the position if you're wrong. So like the stuff that I'm short in there is mostly verticals um, about, well, where we are right now, probably you know, $60 below where the current market is. Like I'm around 660, 655, 660 in that range. So I was looking like on the dance floor this afternoon, but um, you know, not after this earnings, now I gotta get a pullback and, you know, roll forward, buy some time, the whole deal. Now, when you're looking at stuff like this, is that one of the reasons why you would prefer to go with something like a vertical? Because on the contrarian perspective, you know, you can get ran over and it's a kind of a simple way to control risk in there. Is that why you go with that strategy in this context? Only I, I, I normally prefer to be naked on everything. So yep. my, my preference is, you know, always, I would say 85 plus percent of the time I'm going to have um, a naked position on, but in a situation like what's happened in some of these chip stocks, especially Nvidia, I, I don't, I didn't like the risk reward of the naked positions because I just couldn't control the upside skew when that thing was just a runaway train moving like 50 bucks a day. You know, you could get vertical spreads were moving, let's call it a nickel on a $10 move. So you had plenty of wiggle room. There was no, there's no wiggle room on naked options, none. <laughs> you know, so so I figured, listen, I, I don't know if they're gonna split this stock, I don't know what they're gonna do, but if you wanna sell into this kind of a rally, I think you have to do it via verticals. I, I'm normally a fan of fewer contracts, more naked risk, but in a case like this, I think you have to go the other way, more contracts and just um, tighter spreads. Yeah, it makes total sense. It's it's funny because I kind of actively speak out against verticals where I can, but this is one of those contexts that I think it's a bit of a no brainer. Now that leads me to a, a broader thematic, eh, we're coming down to like 716. You might be yeah. all right. Maybe it'll hey, fall. Listen, I'm on, I'm on the same page as you. I, I'm not a fan of verticals. Like I, I don't do a lot of iron condors. I'll do some, you know, if I think vol's really high or I I'll also do iron condors sometimes, which is just two verticals. I'll do iron right. condors sometimes when I feel like the stock's a little thin and I'll get a better fill. If I, you know, if the counterparty doesn't have to spread off any risk, but um, I'll also do verticals and things like SMCI where the market's just too wide, can't trade naked options. But um, in NVIDIA, you can do anything you want. I was just worried about, I mean, I really was just worried about, you know, what happens on some kind of crazy, you know, stupid Zoom type move from a few years ago where you open up 200 points, that kind of thing, you know. It is so funny you say that because that's the first thing I'm thinking about when it comes to these kinds of moves was Zoom specifically. Now, looking at tech, it seems like tech still bell of the ball. They, they're they just running wild here. The Qs was yeah. up massively last year and off to a great start this year. Yeah. What do you make of that? Is like what's happening? I mean, there's not much to make of it other than other than, you know, it. I think I think most portfolio, I think all portfolios of all passive portfolios and all institutional portfolios are grossly overweighted right now. They're highly concentrated. They're grossly overweighted. I, I think they had a crap load of risk 
you know, an absolute shitload of risk today um, in this NVIDIA number, because if you talk about the, the biggest stocks out there, you talk about like Microsoft and Apple, you know, in your, in your, in your top two, you know, $3 trillion companies, um, they don't have as much volatility and as much earnings risk, but NVIDIA had real earnings risk. And I think they were a little nervous because they're all so overloaded in some of these, you know, AI stocks. Um, but I think they skated, but I don't think the skate will last for long. I, I think, I think this might be kind of like a little bit of the blow off top right here. Interesting. And you mentioned AI. Obviously, that's been the subject of conversation for some time now. Yeah. Do you think it's actually something that's going to have a massive impact and can truly drive value for companies like this? Or do you think it's overhyped at this point? Well, I, I do think there is there are many aspects of AI, just like there's many aspects of decentralization that I really think the technology is super cool. But I also think that um you know that i also think ai is priced to perfection at this point i mean it sure feels like it let, let, let's put it this way i don't know but it feels like it's priced to perfection so it's not really a question of you know I and mean, there's no debate um there's i i never debate technology like i don't say oh my god this technology sucks so this is joke and that's not the way i think of things you know like technology is great and and the better the technology the the more potential it has and all that kind of stuff but the markets are usually way ahead you know pricing wise they're they're usually spot on and they've they've moved the price way ahead of the technology and i think that's where we are in ai i think the price is way ahead of the tech it's in interesting you say that to come over to another topic that I, I genuinely am interested in your thoughts on, on that same exact concept about the market pricing and its efficiency in doing so and sometimes getting ahead. It seems like every time this is going to the Fed rate environment, just to give you context on where okay. I'm asking next. And it seems multiple times now, the market started to price a cut, then new information came out and then you can see that the probabilities of a cut have been successfully moving essentially they were backed all the way up to march where it was the first probability of a cut over 50 percent chance and then now that's back out to like june the market seems to be pricing it and then they're not right and then they have to readjust based on new information well there's, there's no new in the market it, it, the market price the, the fed watch tool and the fed just prices everything based right off the bonds and the notes mm -hmm. and the, whatever it is so whether you're doing the two years five years ten years or, or 30 years the the fed watch tool is just and the cme watch tool are just simple math equations based on actual price bonds right. went, bonds at 125 the long bond at 125 or the 10 year at you know 113 that price is in a cut to march you know a, maybe multiple cuts to June. But when bonds drop from 125 down to, you know, under 118, where they close today, and when notes drop from, you know, 113 down to under 110, then 109 and change, you're talking about that absolutely takes the rate cut right off the table for March and pushes it out to June if you're lucky. I mean, if the bonds stay here, there, there's no rate cut in June. If the bonds rally back, which I think a lot of, like, I'm playing long bonds here because I think there's very little downside. Not because I think the, I don't love the upside in bonds and rates necessarily being lower, but I think that after a five or six percent sell-off, it's really interesting to me because they're cheap relative to stocks. I think you, something's got to give here. Either bonds have interest rates have got to go lower and bond prices have to go higher, or stocks have to go lower because stocks and bonds have disconnected and the divergence between the two right now is it's too funky. It stinks. There's something something's rotten. So. I was betting that that I'm betting right now I'm long bonds and short stocks because I think either stocks are going to go lower or bonds are going to go higher. And I, I kind of like that play, um, but that's it. I mean, that's just my own two cents. Who knows what's really going to happen? Yeah. And then within the stocks, what are your thoughts on large cap versus small caps? I'm long small cap, short large cap here. I mean, only because small cap is underperformed because of the move in the bond market so when you get the when you get rates to jump as much as they've jumped in just the last you know couple of weeks on that five or six percent sell-off in bonds you're going to get small caps to underperform um and relative to the 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 russell relative to the s p's and the russell relative to the nasdaq has grossly underperformed so 
I like Russell here. I'm long Russell futures and I'm short S&P and NASDAQ futures, um, mostly S&P futures. So far that, that trade has not worked. Came in a bit last week, but then it widened out, you know, yesterday and today. Um, I, I still think that's kind of the trade of that for the next couple of months. I really like that trade. But in order to like that trade, you've got to like bonds. And in order to like that trade, you've got to dislike stocks. Now, is there a reason why you go short S&P versus decoupling tech from that equation? Because to me, it seems like if you remove tech, your position probably would be doing well. But because tech is still moving so well within the S&P 500, obviously struggling a bit. Curious your thoughts yeah. behind that. Well, I mean, I'm, I, I don't like to get too cute. And I think when you're talking about, especially, you know, if you're going to make a pairs trade, um, you kind of have to use futures. There's not really pairs trades with stocks are too expensive or too capital intensive and pairs trades with options are too lopsided, especially if you're a short seller, you know, especially if you like the short side. So if you're a premium seller like me, you can't really use options for pairs trades that forces you into futures. Futures have less optionality than other instruments. So they're pretty black and white. So I kind of like the, um, you know, the leverage and the simplicity of futures for pairs trades only, you know, and so, so, so it doesn't give you a lot of flexibility. I mean, you really have, you know, there's three futures in the index world that you, that are liquid enough to trade. There's the Russell, there's the NASDAQ and the S and P's. So those are your three food groups. There's not really a lot of other stuff you can do. Got it. Makes sense. When you look back at 2023, I know you've done a couple series on this on Tasty Live, which have been really cool, but I'd love to just touch on that really quick because there's a couple things I've heard in some of those segments that I thought were really interesting. But 2023, in a nutshell, what stood out to you? Um, I think that th the surprise for me in 2023 was um, the the overall strength of the market. I think that the the I'm, I was genuinely surprised by how strong the NASDAQ was in 2023. Um, I don't want to say it caught me off guard because I wasn't I didn't get really short in 2023, but I definitely was not long enough. I was not um, uh, if I was long, it wasn't the right stuff necessarily. I didn't believe. I think I was too too much of a skeptic um, on on some of these tech stocks too early. I just didn't think that it had they had as much legs as they had. So the biggest surprise to me was the strength of the NASDAQ to go to, you know, what, whatever it ended up finishing up for the year. But that was a pretty significant, um, you know, that was a pretty significant run in 2023, much outside. Of, it was way outside of the expected move for the year. And then how does that carry over to this year? Tech not slowing down. Well, I, you know, obviously the, the tech markets, the markets don't know, you know, they don't, they don't have a calendar like we do, you know, so it's a little different, but as an option trader, you know, um, I'm not a reversion to the mean guy at all, but, but I am a realist and I do believe that, you know, there's things like, you know, that still exist like gravity and, um, um, <laughs> yeah. And and capitulation and stupidity. Are those just words for a reversion to a mean? No, 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 no. There's a big difference <laughs> between. I don't sit around and play for mean reversion when it comes to price, but I do think there's certain situations where you know, like, I mean, I'm not getting long. I'm not getting long Nvidia here. That's for sure. Hmm. Have you guys done any recent research on post earnings announcement drift? Um, we've done a little bit. It's very hard. It's yeah. the research that we've done on post earnings is that that they tend to be very 50 50 ish. Like if you even if you looked at the last couple of, you know, like if you looked at the last couple of major earnings reports, even the last, I don't know, um, week or so or a couple of weeks, there hasn't been that much consistent follow through. I mean, Coins the only one I can think of that's had a huge reversal. Um, there's generally been a little bit of like immediate fall through, but then they've kind of reversed. Like if you think about Tesla, you know, it's it's bounced off its lows. When you think about Microsoft, it bounced off its lows pretty quickly. Um, there hasn't been too much too much reversal to the downside. It's, the only one I can think of is Coinbase. Um, you know, Meta the same thing. You know, a lot of pressure to the upside. So I, I, 
I, recently, re, if you talk about recent bias or something, I, I don't think there's been that many takeaways. Um, our own research shows that post earnings, I always thought there was some like continuation of the earnings trend, but the reality mm -hmm. is it's not that much different than normal positive drift. I would love to put a bug in your ear if I can to see if your team would be willing to take a look at the data segmenting it and not looking at large cap, but like small cap and mid cap, because I've been running a study now on it for eight years. And I've found similar data points when it comes to large cap, not showing much post earnings announcement drift potential, but I've been still seeing it in small and mid cap, which I've been finding interesting over the following subsequent quarter to be specific, not for yeah, um, yeah. yeah specific long run timeframes. I, I think I think we we our research would confirm that based on what I remember, but the difference between like we've seen positive drift in the last, let's call it, you know, 10 to 15 years, the positive drift has been more like, you know, five or 6% positive drift as opposed to like historically, let's call it three, three and a half percent. So when we looked at the earnings, the difference was, I think like 57, 43, as opposed to 55 and a half, you know, 40, 44 and a half. So, I mean, we're talking about like a 1% difference. It, it was, it was statistically insignificant from a trader's perspective. Yeah, that, that makes sense. When you s take a look at how 2023 behaved, 2024, first two months, in line with expectations, any surprises thus far? Um, I think from my perspective, yeah, there's been some surprises. I'm surprised by the strength of these um, I'm probably not surprised by the strength of the S and P's as much as I'm surprised by the strength of these, you know, chip stocks specifically, you know, um, Nvidia, um, SMCI, SMCI before it crapped out, but you know, clearly Nvidia up into the 700s, um, and I think you know Microsoft being able to hold over 400, the S and P's being able to pretty much you know hold tight at 5,000. I kind of feel like that's been a surprise for first quarter. Yeah, and then looking over earnings, anything stick out to you there? We're obviously closing down this next quarter, at least for me. I've been surprised to see the number of beats, but not significant follow through. Actually, literally what we were just talking about in terms of um, PEED. So anything stick out to you for earnings? Um, earnings, I, I mean, nothing that's nothing that's at the level where you know there hasn't been i mean other than meta which i think you know kind of that was a little bit that was outside the range and a little bit of us I, I would say meta was the biggest surprise and the most difficult to trade i would think that everything else has been kind of in range got it pivoting a little bit Whenever I do these with you or with other people, I always try to see if anybody has questions and serve as a conduit. I know that you answer emails like a madman, but just to throw more questions at you. One of the questions I got for you is actually really fascinating. This one's from Reddit. And the context behind it is about kind of the evolution of retail traders. You've been at the forefront of that technology for a hot minute now. And the person was asking what you think the next wave for retail traders looks like. And I'll kind of leave it at that for now. They have some clarifying points that I can add on if you need, but just at a high level, I'm curious what you think about that. Well, we, we've we clearly gotten to the point where, you know, I, I, I would think that if you asked the same question 20 years ago, um, it would have been hard to project, you know, where we've taken the futures and derivatives business to as a percent of the overall business. I mean, for the most part, you know, stock trading is a thing of the past because how many people can afford, like in the case of NVIDIA as an example, how many people can afford a, you know, a $720 stock? You're really talking about a situation where, you know, a hundred shares, you know, puts you behind $71,000, average account size, let's call it 50. It doesn't even make sense. So, so most people have moved to, you know, in the case of another using an NVIDIA example, move to like, you know, short verticals, whatever, whatever else it is, but define risk trades where capital efficiency has become kind of the name of the game. So, um, so the most important thing is we've shifted from, um, 
we, we've, we've shifted in a couple of different directions. One, we've moved towards a uh, capital efficient structure where people you know, really start to understand capital efficiency. The other thing I think that we've done is like a few years ago or 10, 20, 30 years ago, you would have heard people say, I'm an option trader. I'm a futures trader. I'm a stock trader. But today you have to be product indifferent. Like it makes it should make no difference to you whether you're trading, you know, um, whether you're trading something in Bitcoin or you're trading something in in corn or you're trading something in crude oil, or you're trading something in NVIDIA, you know, or IBM. Like it, it should make absolutely no difference. Like the same strategies, understanding that the same models apply, everything. I mean, the biggest change we've seen in the last 20 years is the advancement of um, marketplace efficiency because high frequency market making has changed the entire game. Anybody can do anything they want in any underlying. And if you can do it in a capital efficient way and you can do it with virtually no commissions and you can do it on really cool software that's all for free, you know, just think of where we've come in a very short period of time. You know, where's the next jump gonna be? Is it gonna be in the decentralized space? Is it gonna be tokenization? Or is it going to be that these platforms are going to be um, more inclusive of alternative type investments, including, you know, decentralized investments. I think that is the answer. I think that over the next five to seven years, um, everything from event-based trading mm -hmm. to, to decentralized and tokenized trading, because the problem is right now, you're really limited to, um, unless you want to change currencies, you're limited to a domestic market. And because of lots of things, you know, there's lots of restrictions. As soon as we can do things in a tokenized form, um, we can basically trade any marketplace in the world in a single currency. And by doing that, um, we really open up the whole world and, and virtually any investment to anybody. So I believe that the future of this business is going to be much more um, inclusion in products like event-based, which includes everything from politics down to, because you make a market on anything. So it includes politics, it includes markets from a single currency or a single cryptocurrency into any listed equity marketplace anywhere in the world. I think these exchanges are gonna get incredibly bold and the market makers are gonna get incredibly bold. And there's no reason why they can't make a market in everything. It's, it's really gonna be a challenge for us on a regulatory side you know, the, 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 the hurdles we have and the blockers are like, you know, the SEC, Gary Gensler, all that kind of stuff. Those are, those are hurdles. But without those, you know, as long as we continue to push the technology to the forefront, um, I don't see why everything, why anything is off the table in the next 10 years. That includes politics, events, um, sports betting, tokenization, all from a single platform and all with high frequency, one tick wide markets. That's the interesting part, that, that very last part. What do you think, yeah, what, what do you think about, and I know we have uh, like maybe 10 minutes left, a little less than that, so a couple questions. The first one is talking about event-based contracts. They're relatively new, obviously gaining some speed. People tend to akin them to binary options, which is obviously slightly yeah. different, yeah. but yeah. Talk a little bit about your perspective on event-based contracts and how they can fit into somebody's portfolio. Well, they essentially are binary. They're, they are binary trades. And they're, they're in the current form, I, I think they're, I don't want to call them gimmicky, but in the current form, they are less interesting because they are not complementary to like a portfolio with theta decay. They're not complementary even to zero DTs. There's, there's a lot of things that are, that are very uninteresting to them from normal traders, but this is how things start, right? This is how you, this is how you break into it. There's no reason that event-based stuff has to be binary. Like it's just, the reason it is right now is for, is a regulatory reason. Um, but there's no reason that it needs to stay that way. There's no reason that, that, you know, that, that it has to be, Hey, if it trades here, it's a win or law, you know what I'm saying? It, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be a binary contract. So the, the nice thing about event-based stuff is that it's just, it's in its infancy and eventually it's going to transition over to being, you know, a normal listed product. 
because it should make no difference to you. I mean, listen, if we're sitting here trading NVIDIA earnings, right, which is which is an implied move of let's call it 10%, right? And what's the difference if you're trading that or an unemployment number or a PPI number? I mean, there, it's the NVIDIA earnings after the close are a binary event. There's no difference between trading a binary event that is actually much bigger than NVIDIA earnings. Like we should, and there should be options around that. There should be ways to play that, you know, so that, um, so that it, it opens up the whole marketplace. You know, years ago, we really didn't even have a, a good market for options on futures, but there's such demand for it and there's such strategic demand that we've created this high frequency marketplace now that is essentially one tick wide. There's no reason why we don't have that in digital assets. There's no reason why we don't, we haven't converted, you know, um, digital asset technology, which is awesome into a tradable marketplace. There's no reason why we haven't done it in the event-based marketplace. And there's absolutely no reason why we haven't done it in the political marketplace and in the sports marketplace. Like they're, they're all the same stuff to me. It doesn't, we should be completely indifferent to what it is. And I, I think that's just kind of, you know, tip of the iceberg, capital efficiency, people managing their own stuff, um, taking risk, whatever it is, being strategic, you know, no edge either way. I love it. Speaking of taking risk, NVIDIA is now at 738. Unfortunately, not moving the way you are. Not, where I, not where I would not where I would yeah. ideally want it. Now it's up seven dollars. <laughs> so now it's now it's at its expected move, you know. Unfortunately. Not 739. Great. Um one other question I had for you. When we're talking about the evolution of options traders, there are things that I imagine that are common mistakes you see made, that's timeless. Same mistakes made 50 years ago, same mistakes made now. Yeah, I'm not sure. so interested in those. I'm curious about what do you think are some of the new mistake options traders are making that are kind of more unique temporally to now? Well, I don't think there's like a such a thing as a new mistake, but I do mm -hmm. think there's such a thing as the old mistakes kind of repeating themselves because you have new players. Um, I mean, you know, we're in a, we're in a, we're in kind of, um, we're in a business where, you know, like the same, think about it, make a comparison to like baseball, for example, you know, the same things that were messing with hitters heads in 1920, 1924 are messing with hitters heads in, you know, 2024, you know, the pitcher's got a great curveball, or, you know, they're messing with speeds and whatever else it is. I mean, it's just things become technically more advanced and they become, um, you know, and we look at things a little differently because it's a different era and it's a different, you know, ages and strengths and all that kind of stuff. But the reality is the same things that played with your head, you know, a hundred years ago are playing with your head today. And the same mistakes that we make as, as speculators, as risk takers, as gamblers, whatever you want to call it, um, those are the same things. It's, it still mostly boils down to size size kills that's it and there and that after the size you know everything else is is really small in comparison i agree i have one thought to tack on to that i'm curious what your input is are you familiar with the dunning kruger effect i don't think so it's essentially the learning curve but it's our self-perception of competence so it's kind of yeah, like a sure. yeah okay so yeah. the one of the things I hypothesize, you would know better than me, is that with access to near unlimited information, absolutely incredible technology, to me it seems like traders start to think that their skill set is above where it is much faster now than what it used to be than if they were to sit down and read a book, which ultimately leads to what you were just talking about, manifest in terms of sizing, right? We feel like we know what we're doing, now we're gonna size bigger. Do you think that's, any validity behind that or do you just think it comes down to same sizing mistakes no matter what i the learning curve is i mean the amount of information that's out there and your ability to go from point a to point b in you know 20 years ago was very expensive and very time consuming your ability to do it today is far less expensive because most of the content is free and it is much quicker because there is so much content out there. So 
I would say that the learning curve has been dramatically shortened. Plus the markets are tighter. And when you have tighter, more efficient markets, it's a lot easier to learn, to play and learn than it is when markets are wide and it's very cost, very expensive to learn. Um, so yeah, all those, you do learn a lot faster now. You learn a lot quicker, you learn a lot faster. Um, the, the, I'm not sure that, that that changes like what some of the pitfalls are. I'm not sure that changes, you know, I mean, yeah, you get from point A to point B way quicker. I'm not sure if that still changes how you deal with risk and things like that. I mean, there's still, you need a certain number of occurrences to at least understand, you know, what's happening and what you're looking at. Yeah, it makes total sense to me. Now, one last question before we let you get out of here. What's something that you do that is like a do as I say, not as I do in trading? Um, well, it, <laughs> based on my NVIDIA position, it would be <laughs> exactly exactly what we just talked about. <laughs> do as I say, stay small. Don't do as I do. Um, you know, like, you know, I have an ego. I'm a trader like everybody else. I mean, the one thing, I think the one difference between me and most of the other people in this that run companies as businesses, I, I love the markets. I participate nonstop. I don't care, you know, what it is. You know, I make I made a hundred trades today. I, I love playing, you know, same playing field as everybody else. Um I sometimes I do lots of stupid stuff. Not I mean, like I, I tell myself no, but you know, sometimes I just get mad at myself. And um um other times, you know, I'm really like I might go two months and and I'll have losing trades, but I won't do anything stupid. And then I might go like two weeks where I'm just like, I'm, I'm binging on stupidity and, um, you know, and it just, so, so I, I think that, you know, don't beat yourself up too much. It's something that we, we kind of all do. It's worked for me both ways. Like sometimes it works and, and, and I kill it. And I think I'm a freaking genius. And other times, you know, I get killed and I think, oh my God, I can't believe I just did that. I'm so, I'm so, I get mad at myself, not the markets. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I always make the joke that if you're a trader, there's always a little bit of degenerate in you somewhere. It lives in there and it, it pops out every once in a while. So oh, yeah, we, I, yeah. We, we, we like to call some of the stuff we do like a, a degen financial network because, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, we, we definitely yeah, I, feel, we definitely feel that that's, that's in our blood and I don't, there's nothing wrong with that. Just so you know, there's nothing wrong with it. I don't it's think, helpful. yeah, I, I feel like it has to be there in order to, to take risk. Uh, unless you're willing to step out there and take a risk, you have to have a certain temperament. So yeah, I, th yeah. I think overall, as long as it's net positive, it's good. But all right, Mr. Saznov, we know you have other things to do. You're a busy man. We gotta get you out of here, but thank you so much for hanging out. I'll throw links to all of your stuff in the show notes below, but thank you for hanging out. As always, that was great. Good talk, fun stuff, and uh, anytime you want. Awesome. Thanks, Tom.